Hi, Pastor Bob Yandy, and today we are talking on the subject of theology, and today we're taking up the theology of the church. Did you know something? A building is never called the church in the Word of God. People who attend there are called the church, and the church will live forever. Our buildings will one day be destroyed. Sound interesting? Let's go to the Word of God together. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word. This is a great day to open up the Word of God. Of course, any day is a good day to open up the Word of God. But I have trusted God before this broadcast, this is gonna to minister to somebody because we're taking up basic theology and have for the past numbers of weeks. In basic theology, we've talked about the word theology, that is the study of God. We've talked about the fall of man and uh, how that we are in Adam and when Adam failed and Adam sinned, we were in him and so his consequences came to us in Adam all die. We talk about faith for salvation and uh, that's always been faith for salvation. There's never been any other means. The law was never given for salvation. It's always been simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They called him Jehovah in the Old Testament. The fourth thing we took up was unlimited atonement. Jesus didn't die for a select few. He died for the entire world so that anyone can receive him as Lord and Savior. And perhaps some of you haven't heard of limited atonement, but there are some churches and some that, that preach limited atonement. But according to the word of God and my understanding of it and so many's understanding of it is for God so loved the entire world that whosoever, not certain ones, but whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then last week we talked about advocacy and advocacy is Jesus Christ as our advocate, our attorney, the one that fights for us. And uh, so we have a prosecutor coming against us, but Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are our advocates. And then we took up dispensations and times, dividing up the time periods around us and seeing where we live and what time period and what the next one's going to be. We talked about that. And today we're going to take up the doctrine of the church. This again is theology. What do I mean by theology? The basic thing I'm talking about here is this is just not for what you're calling. It's not just, you know, can you sing songs or things like this is absolutely our relationship to God, our relationship to the world. This is the big ones. And so that's why we are taking this up. And today, again, we're going to be talking about the church and the definition of the church. For those of you watching for the first time, this is how I teach. I love to teach a verse at a time, a word at a time sometimes, and just take and explode the word of God. And uh, what happens there is faith rises in your heart because Faith comes by hearing, understanding the word of God. So today we're taking up again the doctrine of the church. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 16 today. And uh, this is where we're going to start out because this is the first use of the word church that Jesus gave to his disciples. So let's talk about the again the uh, church and what God has to say about it. In the Greek, the word for church is ekklesia, and it means the called out ones. Ek means to call, klesia means uh, the ones, the called out ones. And so the called out ones here represent the fact that we are in the world and God has called out a certain group of people. The word is used in the Attic Greek for the assembly of the citizens to conduct the affairs of state, such as in Ephesus, and that's found in Acts chapter 19 and verse 32, and there it was uh, called the assembly of the citizens together. It is spoken of in the Old Testament. The New Testament uses the word for the Old Testament, and it's for the Old Testament assembly of the Jewish citizens, whether they were in the desert, in the tabernacle, or in the temple, the people coming together is called the church in the New Testament, used in the New Testament for a local assembly of saints, of one church or can be a number of churches. Galatians is dedicated to the churches of Galatia, Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1.1 1, 1 is dedicated to the church at Thessalonica. And then Revelation chapter 2 and 3 talks about the seven churches. So whether or not we're talking about an individual church, we're talking about a, a group of churches, the same word is used for both. So the word church is used for the universal church, and that also speaks of every believer in the world. That's Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And I've 
myriad of other verses that describe again the lo the local church is mentioned at the beginning of many of the of the uh, uh, epistles, but also it's mentioned in the book of Acts where they went out and established the church at Ephesus and the church at Thyatira, and so these others are mentioned there. But the word church is also used again for the universal church, and that is every believer in the world. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22 and Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Here's the interesting thing about the word church, ecclesia. The interesting thing is the word was never used for the building. It's always used for the people who assemble in the building. And the first use of the word church by Jesus was to his disciples. And that's the verse we're going to be starting with, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. You see, we often talk about, well, I go to the church down there and this one goes to the church down there. And I've even had, there was a time when our church needed a new building. We started looking around for buildings and people had mentioned me, there's a grocery store that's empty down there. Some mentioned there's there's a you know a, a building down there that's got a lot of offices in it, we could use that. And some people in church got very upset, said, no, no, that's being used by the world. We don't want a building being used by the world. Well, the point of it is the building is not the church, it's the people meeting in there. And it's not called the church until we are in there because we are the church moving into the building. We are not the church moving into the church. No, the church is a representation of all believers in the world. And then local churches are the people who meet there. And then the building they're in just happens to be the building. You know, when I, I had our uh, the first building built, that our church had, when I looked at it, I thought, you know what, this building, you know, it didn't even look like a church. It just looks like more like an office building or something. And my first thought is as the church expands, it'll be very easy to sell it. We can sell it to a business. And sure enough, when we sold it, uh, a pizza place bought it and used it for their main place to teach people how to make pizza for the surrounding areas around there, numbers of states. And that didn't work out so well. So they eventually sold it and a Christian school bought it. So again, it doesn't matter what the building is used for. In fact, when the rapture occurs, when we go to we're hauled off into heaven. Our first thoughts can be, I don't care what they use the building for. You know, they can use it for most anything except for sin. I didn't want them used for sin, but it's something that, that comes back to it. We were the church and we just happened to meet in that building. We, as a church, moved to another building later on, but that building, although we called it the church, it was really the place that housed the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church itself, which is the body of Christ, which is all believers, will live on forever and forever, and our buildings will be gone one day. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, this is where I had you turn to the beginning again. I'll read it again. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice what Jesus said here again. I will build my church. Let's talk about that. Jesus is the builder of the church. We're not talking here about the building and Jesus can help move money into it and cause people to give and, and, and you know, and bring a conviction on people to give into a building program. That's wonderful. But the building itself is not the church. Jesus is the builder of the church. And again, this is the universal church and the local church is what we're talking about here, not a physical building. So again, I will build my church. Next of all, again, not only is Jesus the builder of the church, he's the owner of the church. I will build my church. And his church is the church, again, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church that is believers in your city, in your state, in your community, in the building you go to, but also it is the church all around the world at the same time. I want you to know what I said to also, I will build my church. Oftentimes, pastors are trying their best to get people to come to church when Jesus said, you do what I've asked you to do. You preach the word, you trust in the Holy Spirit, you have, believe in the healing power of the Holy Spirit where people can come and get physical needs met as well as spiritual needs met. And that's why he said, I will build my church. There may be people out there telling you, you cannot build this church. We will not allow you to build this building. And Jesus said, I will build my church. So no matter what people say, if they turn me down on this corner, I'll just go to another corner. There will be a place that will open up because Jesus said, I will build my church. Next of all, he said, I will build my church. This means literally he builds it one believer at a time. We're talking about over in Peter that as Christians, we are stones, not only just stones, but living stones. You see, back in the day when Jesus was here and the disciples were here, stones were used to build buildings. And so they built them one stone at a time and attached them to the building. And so is the church. It's built one believer at a time. And that believer could be five years old or 50 years old or 78 years old. You know, it really doesn't matter. Everybody that's added to the church is special to the Lord Jesus Christ because he said, I will build my church. And he builds it one stone at a time, one believer at a time. Next of all, Jesus said, I will build my church. 
What's he saying here? The people don't own this building and the pastor doesn't own this building. Jesus owns his church and therefore he provides a building force. If Jesus said, I will build my church, then the point comes back to this pastors, it's not your church. In the New Testament, we find out, and especially too in the Old Testament too, that the shepherd didn't own the sheep. No, he watched over the sheep for the owner. He was hired to do so. So it is with the pastorate. As pastors, you are not the shepherd of the sheep. You are the owner of the sheep. You are the shepherd, but you're hired by the owner of the sheep, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, I will build my church. So the church belongs to Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, the gates of hell and even the world will never prevail or overcome or get the upper hand. They will attack the church of Jesus Christ often, but they're never going to succeed in destroying it. The lowest ranks of demon living in the earth try to overcome one believer at a time, but they will fail. We have power to cast them out in the name of Jesus. The highest ranks of demons ruling over nations try, but they're going to fail too. And Satan will try through Antichrist and Armageddon, but he's going to fail. And here's the point. God's even and going to perform protection, take the church out of here before the tribulation starts. So when Satan thinks he's got the upper hand, poof, one day the whole church is going to disappear. And that whole church is all believers around the world taken into heaven, and then the tribulation is going to start. It comes back to this. If you compare the universal church and compare it to the local church, then what's true for the universal church is also true for the local church. Galatians chapter three, take a look at verse 27 and verse 28. And here Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. God simply sees no division in the universal church. He doesn't see racial distinctions. He doesn't see uh, male or female distinctions. He doesn't see slave or free person. And he says, we're all one in Jesus Christ. We are as much a member of the church and we are as much a member of the family of God as Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ is seen as our elder brother. So again, since God sees no division in the universal church, there should be no racial distinctions in the local church. We can't get upset when different races come. Just listen, let them in and preach Jesus to them and watch them get saved. In heaven, there's gonna be such a great group of people on the sea of glass of every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation, and all giving praise to God because they've been born again through the blood of the Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ. There should be no social distinctions in the church. Rich people, poor people, it doesn't really matter. Jesus doesn't see them that way. And even with rich people, they're not gonna take their money to heaven with them. There should be no sexual distinctions in the local church that is favoring men over women or women over men. It simply comes down to this. In Christ, there is no male or female. Ministers, I'll say this. You should accept and bring to Christ anyone who comes through the door. Don't look at their color. Don't look at their nationality. Don't look at whether they're male or female, their gender. Look at this. They are a person who simply needs Jesus and they need the power of God. When we come back, we're going to talk about how the church can even be seen in original creation. We'll be right back. Bible doctrines are easy to understand. They only seem difficult because they often come disguised as complicated or deep-sounding concepts, but their explanations are simple. In Theology Simplified, Volume 2, Bob Yandian breaks down eight more foundational doctrines that will bring strength and stability to your Christian life. Twelve messages include the Bible doctrines of advocacy, the church, dispensations, the fall of man, the study of God, the judgments, faith for salvation, and unlimited atonement. These 12 episodes from the Student of the Word broadcasts are available as audio CDs, video DVDs, or both audio and video on a USB flash drive. To order Theology Simplified Volume 2, visit our website at bobyandian.com. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without the Word of God, our lives would be unstable and without direction. There would be no hope for believers or, for that matter, the entire world. 
In this seven-part series, Pastor Bob Yendian emphasizes and explains the vital necessity of the Word of God in the life of every believer. Sermon titles include A More Sure Word of Prophecy, The Inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's Reputation, The Wisdom of God's Word, The Merchandise of Wisdom, Wisdom, Riches, and Honor, and Jesus, Our Wisdom. To order, go to bobbyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. For those of you watching this broadcast and you are partners with me, I just simply want to say thank you. I couldn't get it done without you. God has called me, but you know what? You're the one who sends the finances to make it available. God gives the power, God gives the calling, but people send the finances. God doesn't rain down finances from heaven because he's not a counterfeiter. He uses the will of people, the love of people for the ministry of God. And thank you who are now supporters of me. Thank you who are partners with me for standing with me in this call, in this endeavor that God has placed in my heart. If you would like to become a partner with me, then go to bobyandian.com. You'll find a place there where you can become a partner. And I thank you in advance for hearing the voice of God. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, where you take a look at verse 22 coming up, but I want to introduce it. The church can even be seen in original creation, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. There are different words used in the book of Genesis, the opening chapters, talk about how that God made and created and did the different things. And the first word that's used is the word create, bara, B-A-R-A. It means to create something out of nothing. The second word we're going to take a look at is asa, and that means to make something from existing material. God created everything. Then some of the things he created, like dirt, he then took it and made something. So he made something out of nothing, and then he took what he had made out of nothing, and he made it, and he made it into the body of man. We're going to take a, take a look at that, animals and all this. The third word is the word yatsar. It's spelled J-A-T-S-A-R, and this word means to mold or to shape, much like a sculptor does. And this is what God did with the body of Adam. The next word is the word bana. And bana means to build something a piece at a time, much like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You put a piece in, you put a piece in, and you begin to build this. And we find out that God created all matter. And then from that matter, he made everything on earth. He made animals, he made the trees, he made everything else. But God created the raw material first. And then from that raw material, he began to make things. So God made or molded and shaped the man. When God made the man, he molded him and shaped him like a potter does or like a sculptor does. And so he took the dirt and did it like this, you know, and made the man, made everything about him. But the man was not alive yet until he breathed into him the breath of life. And so God made Yatsar or shaped the man and then created the spirit of man in him with his breath. And so that's the word bara. Man was made in his body out of existing materials, but then God breathed into him something that did not exist. And that was the spirit of man on the inside created. So man is both made and created. The body was the part that was made out of the dust of the ground and the internal part was created by God and it is eternal. The body will one day go back to what it came from, which is the dirt, but the spirit of man and the spirit of the woman on the inside will live on forever. And so the next thing that happened was, again, God created, first of all, the heavens and the earth. He made dirt, he made water, he made air, and he created that out of nothing. He just spoke it into being. But then what he had spoken into being, he made things out of it. He made all life, fish and birds and cattle and man's body. Next of all, he made Adam's body from the dirt, and that's the word we took up, Yatsar, J-A-T-S-A-R, which means he molded and shaped it and made it in his image and in his likeness. And then the next thing did was God created both Adam and Eve's spirits by breathing into Adam's body the breath of lives, and that's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. But I want to take a look here at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 22, and that was there came a time 
Eve was actually placed inside of Adam. He made them at the same time or created them at the same time, but he made them at two different times. I'm going to say that again. He created them at the same time, but then he made them at two different times. So inside of Adam, Eve was already there in spirit form. And then one day he put Adam to sleep and removed her from him and he made a body for her. Genesis 2.22, it says, then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, bana or built. Man had been molded and shaped in his body, but the woman was built. He made her one piece at a time. And while Adam was sleeping, God just built her one piece at a time. Took a lot of time to make her much slower than how he made a man and much slower than how he made the animals. He made or built the woman and then he brought her to the man. Adam woke up and was suddenly missing something. He had had her within himself. And so God placed them in him. And then while he was asleep, he removed her from him, her spirit, and took it out. And then from Adam, he took one rib out. And from the rib of Adam, he built this woman. And when Adam woke up, va, va, voom, he had never seen anything like this before. Genesis chapter five, verses one and two says this. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man. He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, blessed them and called their name Adam or mankind in the day they were created. Notice this, they were created on the same day, but they were made on two different days. We don't know how long she was in Adam. He got to name all the animals. He got to dress the field. And then one day after all that was done, Adam went to sleep and God took her out of him and built a body for her and separated the two. So earth was created, then all life made from what had cre- had been created. The earth was created, then all life was made from what had been created. Adam was made, then created, but Eve was created and then made. She's different than man. Man was made first and then God breathed his spirit and created the spirit inside of Adam. But Eve was created first. And so she was inside of him. When God breathed into Adam, he breathed into him the breath of lives and it's plural in the Hebrew. And so Eve was in Adam when he was made and then she was removed and later she was built. We find this in 1 Corinthians 11, 8, for man is not from the woman, but the woman is from the man. So again, we have here, again, Eve was inside of Adam and then her spirit was taken out and a body was built for her. Eve represents the church, the bride of Adam and the church is the bride of Christ. Notice this, Eve represents the church because she was taken from Adam's side as a rib, a very small portion. From Jesus' side, a rib of 120 was taken and Jesus has been building his church from that day. The bride will be one day completed at the judgment seat of Christ because he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church has been inside of Jesus Christ all this time, but on the cross, there was a small part taken and in the upper room, that 120 was that rib portion taken out. But by the end of the day, there were 3,120 that that had been taken out. And next of all, a few days later, 8,120 as the church began to be built. And suddenly, instead of one Jesus on the earth, Satan faced thousands and thousands of Jesuses on the earth. And his job ever since then has been running everywhere, trying to stamp out the Christians, but he's not going to succeed because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Ephesians 3.14 says this, for this reason, I bow my knee to the Father, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The church is divided right now. Uh, The church, whenever you die and leave this earth, you go to be with the Lord in heaven. And the church is called the body of Christ on earth. And the church is called the family of God on earth and in heaven. Notice this, the family exists in heaven and on earth. And the church will be called the bride of Christ in heaven. One day when we get to heaven and have gone through the judgment seat of Christ, we will at that time be called the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, when we die, 
We leave the church and we leave the body of Christ, but we never leave the family. The family will be united in heaven by the rapture. And again, what that verse of scripture told us was, is that I will build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I bow my knees to the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So one day I'm gonna leave this earth. Should Jesus not come, I'm gonna die, go to be with the Lord in heaven. I will leave the body of Christ, that's only here on earth. I'll leave the church, that's here on the earth, but I never leave the family of God. I will forever be a part of the family of God. And in heaven, I will be called part of the bride of Christ. So one day the church will be married to the groom whose name is Jesus, and that's found in Ephesians chapter five, verse 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Until that day we have spots and wrinkles, but the judgment seat of Christ, they'll all be taken out. That she should be holy and without blemish, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So we have a local church where we meet together in a building, but the building itself is not the church we are. And the main purpose for the meeting of the saints in the local church is two things, to make converts and then make converts into disciples. This is the major thing about the two parts of the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, Number two, make disciples out of all men. The main ones who attend the church are believers. And so that's because when they come, we come to uh, make them into disciples. So probably 90, 95% of the ones coming to church will be believers. But we also have those who are giving the altar calls for people to come and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we should never again think all witnessing is outside the church, though the mass of it is, and all teaching to Christians is in the church. No, we have a, a spillover of both is that we need to again have an opportunity for people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to accept him. Let's give a few things in closing. Biblical analogies of Jesus Christ and the church. Jesus is the chief cornerstone and we are the living stones. Jesus is the great high priest. We're a kingdom of priests. Jesus is the groom. We are the bride. Jesus is the royal king and we are his royal family. Jesus as the ambassador and we now as, as ambassadors of Christ are left here in the earth. And the future of the church is, it began on the day of Pentecost, it will end at the rapture of the church. While the tribulation's occurring on earth for seven years, the church will be going through the judgment seat of Christ in heaven and receiving our rewards. The church will return to earth with Jesus Christ seven years later at the battle of Armageddon and we will return to the earth as the bride of Christ traveling with our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the church will rule and reign with Jesus Christ on earth forever. What am I telling you, church? I'm telling you, you have a great future because you're in Jesus Christ and his future is our future. I'll see you next time. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.